I have been waiting a long time uh, to do this particular study. And basically, in my schedule, I had like a week where I could study sort of anything I wanted. I wasn't going to be teaching the Mark series. And I wanted to get into the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, like the actual theology of the Holy Spirit, proving who the Holy Spirit is according to Scripture and responding to challenges. So we're going to talk about whether the Holy Spirit is personal, whether the Holy Spirit is God. And more than that, our relationship with the Spirit, which is deep, wonderful, and a huge blessing waiting for us to pay attention to. Believe it or not, the Holy Spirit is, in my opinion, I think a lot of people would agree, the most ignored person of the Trinity, the least discussed. And when you as a Christian are challenged to, say, defend the the deity of Christ or something like that, like you can do that a lot better probably than you can defend the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So we're getting into this in detail, right? Because he, he is ignored. Um, false teachers tend to focus on the Holy Spirit. Like Jehovah's Witnesses say the Holy Spirit is merely an active force, is not personal, is not God, is just God's sort of active force. They actually translate their bad New World translation to to adjust or change who the Holy Spirit is. They um, will say things like the Holy Spirit is not masculine, like in the Greek, Holy Spirit, that phrase is not masculine, it's neuter. And so they suggest that this means that the, the, the spirit is non-personal. And again, we're ill-equipped to respond. So it's good to do the work to reestablish basic Christian theology, simple Christian theology, and to go through the process of digging into the scriptures and, and asking, is that really a good proof text? Does that scripture really demonstrate the thing that I want it to demonstrate? Can I really say with confidence the Bible supports this theology that I hold? Because we don't want to fall into the trap of holding traditions because we've always held traditions. Or danger, fall into the trap of thinking that our theology is right because it comes from our authoritative group of Christians. That's dangerous. And, and anybody can fall into this trap. You might be thinking, I mean, Catholics or something. but And there's a connection there. But that can happen to you too. You just assume that if your pastor says it, it must be biblically true. There's two major dangers in this. One is you might be believing things that aren't biblical. And two, even if you are believing biblical truth, you don't know why it's biblical. So when someone challenges you or your kids on their faith, they can't prove it except to point to their pastor and say, he said so. And I want to be able to point to scripture and show that God has really revealed this. So um, every generation, in my opinion, has to do this, has to get back into the word of God, back into scripture, reestablish th those old, always believed doctrines so we won't become victim of false teachings. So the first thing we'll ask is this in today's study. First thing we'll ask is, is the Holy Spirit a person according to scripture? Is he personal, right? Does he have those qualities of being a person, not just sort of like a power? Now against this, I'll offer three points and respond to them quickly. And then we'll dig into a ton of scriptures. First, you get this from some, like say Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll say the Holy Spirit is in neuter in Greek. I mentioned this before. Uh, let me just say this is a silly argument. Um, I don't mean that to be insulting to anybody, but you know, words are masculine, feminine, neuter in Greek all the time. It doesn't make them personal. So love is a feminine word in Greek. That doesn't mean that love is a female, like person. Love is now a person going around because neuter doesn't mean non-person. Masculine or feminine doesn't mean person. That's just not how it works. It's, this is like bad Bad Greek. Um, there's others who would say this, and I, I wouldn't even bring up this argument if they didn't say it, but they say if you're baptized in the Spirit, therefore the Spirit's not a person because you can't be baptized into a person. That doesn't make sense, they say. I think it makes perfect sense personally, but also Scripture seems to prove that wrong when it says that we're baptized into Christ. If we're baptized into Christ, you're not going to tell me Jesus is not a person. <laughs> I don't know how you could sustain that. Others would say, and, and this is probably what you're going to hear if you listen to someone who's opposed to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the biblical doctrine, they're going to say the Holy Spirit has uh, all these verses in the Bible where he's associated with power. And so they'll talk about how power came upon them in the Spirit, um, how they went out in, in, in filled with power through the Holy Spirit, or how often the Holy Spirit comes upon, like say, Samson, and Samson does these powerful acts and deeds. Okay, this is this is true. And if you pull all these scriptures together that relate the Holy Spirit to power, you're going to see there is a connection. The problem with this logic is that it's irrational to think that if the Holy Spirit, because here's what's behind it, right? Let's find the assumption behind it. If the Holy Spirit is related to power, then the Holy Spirit is not personal. But that's irrational. God himself is related to being powerful all the time. He has all the power in the world, in the universe. He's, he's, om he's omnipotent. But this doesn't mean he's non-personal. It's not as though the stronger you get, the less personal you become. That's irrational. And so um, God being associated with power doesn't eliminate his personhood. The way that these people tend to attack the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is sharing a list of scriptures, 
showing the Holy Spirit being associated with power and ignoring all of the verses that show he's personal. We're going to go through those verses now. We're going to show that not only is he powerful, he's also personal. So let's start with John 16, 7. Here we are. And um, and just for anybody who wants to know, I'm, I'm Mike Winger and I'm a pastor in Southern California. I do verse by verse teaching, theology, and apologetics, defending the Christian faith. I want to bring you thoughtful explanations and defenses of Christian truth. I really believe it's intellectually demonstrably pr proven true. And I want to equip others to see that as well. Um, also, I'm in the Mark series right now, but it, Today, I'm doing this Doctrine of the Holy Spirit thing. I'll continue my Gospel of Mark series next week. We'll get back into that. It's going to be a little bit on-off for the next couple months, but I'll explain later on. So John 16, 7, Jesus speaking. And let's start with Jesus. Let's start with the red letters about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. And that would be the Holy Spirit in John 16 and 17. But if I go, I will send him to you. The first thing we're going to see in this is Jesus thinks the Holy Spirit is, um, and he's right, obviously, but he's saying the Holy Spirit is the one who comes when Jesus leaves so that he will come and be with them. There's a relational quality that is in the, there in the Holy Spirit. We'll get this in the next passage as well. And um, I go, he arrives. Let me just make a soft claim about this text. It's more consistent with the idea that the Holy Spirit is personal than impersonal. Otherwise, it doesn't really comfort the disciples all that much that when Jesus leaves them, the Holy Spirit arrives if all he is is power. They're, and you got to remember, these are humans, right? Their hearts are breaking that Jesus, who they love and trust and, and they rely on, he's leaving. And, and he's, his comfort to them is he's bringing them the comforter, the Holy Spirit. It makes more sense that he's personal. But we can make this a whole lot stronger. In John 14, 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is a beautiful passage speaking about Jesus giving us another helper. Helper. Now, in the Greek, this is interesting. You wouldn't see this in the English because we have one word for another. But in the Greek, there's two words for another, uh, alas and het heteros. And these two words, one alas represents another of the same kind, right? Or a, a, another of like the same kind of category of thing. And heteros is another of a different kind. Now, we get this in Galatians 1. In Galatians 1, he says, I marvel that you uh, are so quickly turning from the gospel to another and then he says, which is not another, which in English sounds weird, right? But he says the the other, it's it's heteros, it's an other different kind, false gospel. It's not an alas, another of the same kind. I say all that to tell you the Holy Spirit is like Jesus. He's another helper. Well, Jesus is a personal helper present with them. He is God with them, helping them, guiding them, directing them, teaching them. And then he says the Holy Spirit will be just like that. He will be with you forever. That's relational. That's relational. So Jesus teaches that the Holy Spirit is relational. And to be relational, you have to be a person. Now, you might have had a pet rock when you were a kid, <laughs> but you didn't really have a relationship with the rock. This was fabricated. This was pretend. If you have a relationship with someone, that's a someone, not a something. And he's going to be with you. And just as, as, as Jesus was with the disciples, very relational. And this is deep, deep in the theology of the New Testament. We should not just think it's for our brains only. The Holy Spirit is, is God's deep personal relationship with us is through the Holy Spirit, this, the third person of the Trinity. Let's look at more. I'm going to give you so many scriptures today. I, I hope that this is a, a lesson you could send to somebody else, that they could think these things through. We're just asking, like, we want to believe the Bible. What does the Bible teach us about who the Holy Spirit is? John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. This is an action that the Holy Spirit's doing. He's going to bear witness about me. Um, this is something typically done by humans or persons, I should say. Probably not just humans, because angels also can bear witness. Uh, but by persons, you, you generally have to be personal to bear witness. It's true that like um, in the Old Testament, we have times where say rocks are said to be witness of an event. It really, they're, in that sense, the rocks sit there. And when you see the rock, you remember you set it up, you set that pillar up when this event happened. So the rock is a reminder in a sense. So there you can have an impersonal thing that's like a witness in a sense. This is probably not that because 
just as the Holy Spirit bears witness, we also bear witness. So it's the same kind of witness bearing that's taking place. Here we don't have any sort of physical pillar set up that we can look at. Rather, the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness. This is beautiful. He bears witness to the church of Jesus so that the, that, that the church can be a witness of Jesus to the world. The Holy Spirit is, is um, basically pushing the glory of Christ out of you into the world so that you might tell them about the goodness of Christ as the Holy Spirit is revealing these things to you. So this is an informational bearing witness. This underscores the personal nature of the Holy Spirit. Another verse we'll get to, this is another section where Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verses 8 through 15. And I'm going to read this and I'm going to highlight a few things you might not know. A couple Greek things, most of it's all English, you get it just fine. But when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. So here, the Holy Spirit's bringing conviction. Um, that seems to be a behavior of a person. In fact, this shows, okay, when, you know, earlier we see how the Holy Spirit interacts with the church. He, he speaks to us of Christ that we might speak to the world of Christ. To the world, like we're speaking of Christ, but to the world, the Holy Spirit is, is externally pressing on them, so to speak, telling them that they have sin and that they need Jesus, that they need the Savior. And sin is a driving factor to bring people to Christ. That's part of the very gospel message. What's beautiful about this is as the gospel goes out, the Holy Spirit is also individually working in the hearts of, the hearts of men. I think that's amazing. That, that seems to require a person. But let me read on this. It gets way more detailed than that. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Okay, you got to get this. It's This is great. Jesus has a lot of things he wants to tell the disciples at this point, but they don't get it yet. This is consistent in the Gospels. There's this like theme of the disciples... They're, they're so inundated with traditions and mixed, some biblical, some unbiblical beliefs about the Messiah, that it takes Jesus his whole ministry to try to reteach them the meaning of the Messiah, show who he truly is. And so he's like, there's lots of things I want to tell you, but you can't bear them now. So how will they learn the things Jesus wants to tell them? Well, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He's going he's gonna to be our guide. So here, you know, guides are persons here. He, you know, there's no GPS system at the time, right? There's no guide other than personal guides at the time. And so he'll guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So the Holy Spirit hears and the Holy Spirit speaks. The, you have to be a person to do this, to hear and then communicate and guide others. And he will declare to you things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And here we have the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and their inner relationship as they relate with us. It, it's, yeah, because the Trinity's from the Bible. <laughs> it's kind of how it works. But check this out. This is the Greek part. He will guide you. That is a masculine uh, pronoun being used to talk about the Spirit, even though the Spirit's neuter. He will guide you. This is a masculine pronoun. Then we have it again on his own authority in the Greek, right? This is a masculine pronoun again to talk. So this is very personal to speak of him with that terminology. It shows he's personal. Jesus also says, he will glorify me. Now I know in the English, you have lots of he's here, but in the Greek, it's these three spaces, three spots that really matter. He will glorify me. Again, masculine, masculine personal pronoun. So he's a personal agent doing personal agent things. Now, we've only talked about Jesus here, and we have a lot more to discuss, but we'll do one more um, from Luke 12, 12, where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, and then we'll talk about the rest of the New Testament, and then the Old Testament, the deity of the Holy Spirit. will respond to Islamic claims that the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. We'll get there in a few minutes. All right, so um, Luke 12, 12, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Understand what he's saying about the Holy Spirit. He's like, look, they're going to bring you before, before rulers and you're going to be persecuted. But don't worry about what you're going to say when that happens. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's going to teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, power can like, okay, Elijah, say he, he, he runs a long distance, right? But when, when, uh, when, the, when the rain's going to start coming and he runs a great distance by the power of the Spirit. Samson, he pushes pillars down by the power of the Spirit. You could say that that's impersonal. Let me get to, I mean, the Holy Spirit's not impersonal, but those verses I wouldn't use to prove the Holy Spirit's personal. However, while power can come from an impersonal source, at least potentially, it can also come from a personal one, T 
teaching does not come from an impersonal source. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you in that hour what you ought to say. This isn't even pre-scripted content. This is rather, here's the disciples on trial before governors, kings, whoever. And in that moment when they're asked questions and they're interrogated, the Holy Spirit gives them information to speak so that they will have divine utterance when they're, when they're witnessing uh, during their persecution. This is the, the work of a person. It's the work of a person. Um, in Romans 8.26, let's move on to other texts in the scripture. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what, what to pray for as we ought. You ever feel that way? Yeah, I feel that way a lot. <laughs> but the Spirit helps himself, intercedes for us, with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There are a few hugely important things. Now, often you might read the Bible looking for devotional content, and this is chock full of it, devotional content. But the devotional content is based on theological content that we're supposed to, to learn and know. And when we know theology, it, it creates, I think that what, what theology does is it creates a consistent, solid devotional life in a Christian. Because you don't have to wait for God to like speak something fresh to you to make you feel good at the moment. You know who he is. You know what he's done. And you're standing in faith upon the promises of God at all times. So I think studying theology makes stable Christians. That's, that's definitely what it's done for me, right? I was much more unstable before I understood some of these, some of the theology of, uh, of, of scripture. All right, verse 26, right? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, so he's helping in our weakness. This is very much what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit's going to help you. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. This means that the Holy Spirit prays. This is one of the hugely important things here theologically. The Holy Spirit prays. Now, he's not praying the way that Jesus did when he was on the earth praying to the Father. Rather, he is He is one who um, is like our... Our method of prayer is through the Holy Spirit, is in the Holy Spirit. In fact, scripture even says we pray in the Spirit. But he accesses your mind, your heart, knows you deeply. He knows the mind and will of the Father, and he prays accordingly. So meaning that, yes, a, a Christian can simply posture themselves in prayer, groan to God, saying, I don't know what to pray, Lord. I'm just reaching out to you. And the Holy Spirit is interceding for us, and our prayers are perfected in him. That just transforms your prayer life when you realize the role of the Spirit in your when I don't know how to pray moments. I think it's beautiful. But it requires a person. You, you know, trees don't pray. People pray. Persons pray, right? It doesn't have to be a human here, but, there, but this activity requires personhood. He himself intercedes. Your prayers come to the heart of God through God, ultimately. But also, he has a mind. Look at, look at the next verse, 27. He who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Only persons have minds. You may have passed over this verse and not noticed it before. The Holy Spirit has a mind. There is a mind there. And uh, yeah, only persons have minds. Energy forces do not. Electricity does not have a mind behind it. Ephesians 4.30 is another verse we could look at. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, you know, we don't want to grieve the Spirit, but let's just talk about the fact that we can. You can't grieve electricity. It's not like I ever let down electricity. You know, when I turn off the light switch in the room, it's not like electricity lets out a sigh. Oh, he doesn't like me anymore. Like, this is, that's just weird. You know, the, obviously, to be grieved requires a person who, who has emotions, who is able to respond to the things that are going on in the world. And so don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't make a force sab. You can resist a force. Your scripture says that you can resist the spirit, but I'm not quoting that verse in today's like theology study because you could resist a non-person. I, I could resist gravity, but I can't resist, um, I can't, excuse me, grieve gravity. I can't let gravity down, pun intended. But this is not just New Testament because some people will say, and I'll mention this again later, some people will, will think that the doctrines that we have in the New Testament are kind of new. And while there are many things which are revealed in far greater detail in the New Testament, there is nothing inconsistent with the Old. It's all there in the Old Testament to some degree and then re revealed much more fully in the New. This is an example. Isaiah 63.10, they, being the Israelites, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Okay, here, the Holy Spirit of God 
is spoken of in, 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 there's two sides to this coin in personal terms of being grieved, but as being a different person than the father, his Holy Spirit. That's interesting. The way that it's worded is interesting. And therefore he turns to be their enemy and fights against them. And that would be uh, the father I, I'm, I'm suggesting here. So that's, that's interesting, but it does speak of the Holy Spirit having the ability to be grieved, even in the Old Testament, even in Isaiah, a very old text like Isaiah. Now, the application of this, though, back to Ephesians about don't grieve, I don't want to pass this up because what's the point in the theology if we don't apply it? The Holy Spirit is grieved in, in Ephesians here when we speak corrupting talk out of our mouths, right? When we lie to one another, when we um, have anger, when we have malice, we we have these theft, right? We, we basically, as you read Ephesians chapter four, the last like, you know, half of the chapter, we have all of these behaviors. We, tr we treat each other poorly as Christians. We, we might be deceitful to one another. We might gossip poorly about one another. We might be inconsiderate to others. And those are things that this, this blows my mind. Those are things that grieve the Holy Spirit because he is the one who indwells all of us and binds us together according to the will of God and for the glory of Christ. And here we are letting our flesh tear that up. That grieves the Holy Spirit. And you as a Christian, when you are motivated, not just by the knowledge that something is right and wrong, but when you're motivated by love for God and by love for the Holy Spirit who you don't want to grieve to treat your brethren well, that is huge. That is beautiful. That is like, to me, the bottom, the bottom rung level of morality is this is, okay, this is my own view here. I'll just share it, give something to think about. My, the bottom rung level of morality is I, I don't do stuff that gets me in trouble. Okay, so this is why we have laws. We have laws for people who are on the bottom rung of morality. that They don't do stuff that gets them in trouble. Then there's the, the next level up, which is maybe just a little more forward thinking, is like I don't do stuff um, that maybe doesn't just, doesn't just get me in trouble, but in the long run, it won't really have good impacts. Okay, so now I'm really forward thinking. But both of these are pretty selfish, aren't they? So then you can go to the next level up and you can say, I do stuff because it's right and I don't do that stuff because it's wrong. So there's at least a love for what's good, but it still feels kind of impersonal, doesn't it? Then the next level up, and I'll just skip to the highest level for this, for the sake of this, is love. I do what's right because I love God and I love people and that is my motive. And then love becomes holiness. Love leads to holiness. Love is always consistent with holiness. Love does, love does no harm, right? Uh, love is, does not rejoice in iniquity. There's no wickedness there. And so that's what the Holy Spirit is driving us to. And that shows his heart to us that when we, when we infight, it brings grief. That should be hugely motivational for us to love each other. If any Christian has anything against you, that you would go and fix that. If you have anything against them, that you'd forgive them um, and bless, bless God by doing that. Let's talk about spiritual gifts. Okay, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on spiritual gifts. It deserves a lot of time, but I'm talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, not the spiritual gifts in the church. So I'll just mention it. Uh, the Holy Spirit we know gives spiritual gifts. The, the gifts come from the Holy Spirit. But look at the wording of 1 Corinthians 12, 11. It says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. That's powerful. We've heard earlier the Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit has these relational qualities. He's with us. Um, he, he can be grieved. All these types of things. But here we have the Holy Spirit has a will. Now, you can't have a will unless you are a person. There's personhood there. The Holy Spirit does these things as he wills. Now, side note, Hebrews talks about the gifts of the Spirit as well. But it gives it gives um, credit to God. It simply says that it's we're given the gifts as God wills. So I'll, let me just mention briefly that, that that's because the Holy Spirit's God. All right, um, we'll look at another passage, Acts 10, verses 19 and 20. And this is, if you're, if you're wondering, if somebody would listen long enough, this is, this is the case I would make for them understanding who the, who the Holy Spirit is according to Scripture and to know that he, he's not impersonal, as the Jehovah's Witnesses would say. He's, he's not sort of like a New Testament invention, as some liberals might promote. He is not um, the angel Gabriel as a billion Muslims would be taught around the world. No, no, no. This is, this is who he is. Acts 10, 19. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, the spirit said to him, and now what we're going to see is the Holy Spirit speaking, and he's going to be speaking in first person. And when you say I, 
you're a person. If you can say I genuinely, then you're a person. And here he says, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation for I have sent them. That's of course consistent with the spirit governing the gifts of God and the callings that we receive being governed by the Holy Spirit. That seems to be a special role of the spirit. And Peter went down to the men and said, uh, I'm the one you're looking for. And then he goes on. But in Acts 13 too, we have another example of this. It happens twice in this passage. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Isn't that interesting? So again, the Holy Spirit's the one who's, who's governing the callings of individual Christians in the body of Christ and the giftings that they have. And here he speaks and says, uh, set apart to me, right, for me, the them to the work which I have called them. So again, the Holy Spirit is obviously not a force. In Acts 5, we have what is one of the um, unforgettable passages of scripture, that's for sure. Ananias and Sapphira. I know a lot of people have questions about this passage. Um, I'm tr I don't want to get distracted by those questions. So I'm trying to stay focused. Maybe some other time I could do a separate teaching on it. But here we have a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira. They sell a piece of property. Now they're the first hypocrites in the early church. And generally speaking, God... Uh, consistently throughout the scripture, the first rebels, the first rebels of, of, a, of a new movement of God receive strict punishment. This happens over and over again in the Bible, and it's to demonstrate God's, God's desire for purity in the move of the spirit in our lives. And he really doesn't like religious hypocrisy. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, they sell a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds. Now, he's allowed to do that. But he lies about it. That's the part he gets in trouble for. And uh, brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back part of the proceeds. So he lies to the Holy Spirit. You, know, you can lie about a force, an energy force, but you can't lie to an energy force. You can't lie. I can't, I can't lie to this, this camera lens cover. Like, I can't lie to it. It's, no matter what I say... I could lie about it, right? This is a giant banana, right? There's a lie. But, but for demonstration purposes, don't anybody believe me. But um, but yeah, you can't lie to an, uh, an impersonal thing. The Holy Spirit can also be blasphemed. And you guys know this. This is in Mar uh, Matthew 12. There's actually in multiple gospels. But in Matthew 12, 28, he says, um, Jesus speaking here, he says the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed against and um, bu, 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 bu. here we go, 31. Uh, whoever, every sin and blasphemy would be forgiven the people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, against the Spirit will not be forgiven. So it's, it's, it's parallel to speaking a word against the Son, you'll be forgiven. Speak, speak against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now I know this is another one of those passages that takes us down a rabbit trail because the next question that's in your mind, and I'm not answering it today, is what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I actually have a long teaching on that and it's linked in the video description down below. You're welcome to check it out. You could, you could watch it. And in the first couple of minutes, I summarize the whole teaching. So you don't even have to watch the whole video. Look how nice I am. I'm just shooting myself in the foot, killing my YouTube watch time. And uh, I don't really care. <laughs> so, uh, But that video is there. The point here is that the, the spirit can be blasphemed in a way that's similar to the way the son can be blasphemed. This, of course, implies that he's personal. It also hints at his deity. We'll cover that real soon here, though. So I'll, I'll wait on that. The, um, the Holy Spirit is also in the Bible is the person behind the message of the Bible. This is why in Hebrews 3, 7, it's about to quote Psalm 95. That's this quote portion here. It's quoting Psalm 95. But before it quotes, it introduces it as, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. It's just gr given for granted, taken for granted, assumed and even taught clearly in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit is the person behind the message of scripture. Now, let me walk you through this reasoning a little so you can see why this is like a case for the personhood. See, the Holy Spirit is not the human author, right? We know that. They knew that. That's not, there'd, there'd be a great deal of ignorance to think the Holy Spirit is being referred to as, the, as like a human author here. Um, so that's the psalmist, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit's also not the words on the page. This is not a this is not a, a Christian view. This is not a New Testament, Old Testament view of scripture that the scripture is actually a person, that's weird. And I know some people actually get confused about this. And I'm sorry, that's not, that's not the Christian view. The, the scripture is not a person. There isn't personhood in the actual written words of God. And it's not like uh, Islam where they believe that the Quran has existed for all eternity. 
and it was like dictated by God, that kind of thing. Rather, the Holy Spirit is therefore the by process of elimination, he's the mind behind the scriptures. He is the one who is guiding and directing the authors of the Bible so that what we got from them, while it had human quirks and vocabulary and all that kind of thing, it still had God's message for us. So they could say the Holy Spirit said this. Now that means he's personal. If he's the mind behind the text of scripture inspiring it through the authors, and then he's, yeah, then he's personal. There's a beautiful symmetry here. We'll talk more about symmetry in a minute, but actually several, quite a few minutes. But there's this beautiful symmetry here in the nature of the Holy Spirit. When you look at um, how he's the mess, he's, he's the mind behind the scripture and the scripture, the message of the scripture is Christ. So when you, when you look at the layers, you have the Holy Spirit inspires the scripture. The scripture speaks of Jesus. Now we see the Holy Spirit in his role in the church how he fills us and he teaches us of Christ that we might proclaim Christ to the world. And I'm not suggesting this makes us, us the Bible. Okay, the Bible has its own role that's different than the church. We're not replacing scripture with our things that we think or utter or anything like that. But there's this beautiful symmetry that's there that we are then filled that we might proclaim. You know, he bears witness to us that we might bear witness to the world. And I think that that's beautiful. We see more of this as we continue looking later on when I talk about uh, some of the symmetry of the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. Um, Romans chapter 15, verse 30. And <clears throat> this text says, I appeal to you brothers by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. The idea here that I want to highlight is that this text seems to be indicating that the spirit loves. Loving is a personal quality right? Uh, my camera lens I held up earlier does not love anybody. It doesn't love anything. It just doesn't. It doesn't have that capacity. But the Holy Spirit loves. He loves. That's a big deal. In fact, when you look at the rest of scriptures that talk about this, like First John, that talks about how we love because we're born of God. And of course, we know we're born of the Spirit. I love others because the Holy Spirit is love. He loves so much that his love comes through my life and I love others as a result. My Personally, when I got saved, I, that was one of the things that, that shifted with me is that like just less bitterness, less, less animosity towards people, more love, more grace, more kindness, more hopefulness towards, towards those that maybe I wouldn't externally have a reason to love. And I remember finding it easy to forgive as a Christian. Um, and I, I'm, this is not a pat me on the back moment at all. I think this is... The Holy Spirit's work in our lives. I think as a Christian, generally, if you're a healthy Christian, it's not that hard to forgive, generally speaking. You may have hard times, and that may be a time to devote to prayer or even fasting and to really die to yourself. And that I'm not saying it's always easy to obey God. That's definitely not the case. Not even for Jesus was it always easy, right? Look at him in the garden. Um, but there is something of the inspiration of the Spirit in causing us to love others. Now, I want to highlight something real quick that is so beautiful, and I could spend far more time on it. And that is this idea that God is love. This is a Christian thing. Okay. The, the, the doctrine, the belief that God is love, um, that's very uniquely Christian. It doesn't really come from any other religion. Now others sometimes like say new age, modern new age people might want to borrow from that. They like to sort of borrow from Christianity in some areas, but it's a very, it's a very Christian belief, but here's where it's a problem in monotheism where there's only one God and he exists when nothing else exists. He exists eternally, just, he's just there. It's hard to say that that God is love because you have to ask the question, well, who is he loving? Who is God loving? From eternity past, who does he love? It's difficult to say that. And let me give you an example. Let's say that you, you, you come to me and you tell me, Mike, I am so loving. I am such a hugely loving person. I just love everybody. I love everything. I'm a very loving person. And I'm like, wow. So tell me about who you love. Like, tell me about the relationships you have. Oh, I don't have any relationships. I don't know anybody. I never see anybody. I never talk to anybody. But I am just, I'm big on love. I'm like, well, no, like, <laughs> you're not really. Unless there's a way to express love, how are you loving? And this is where the doctrine of the Trinity comes in. Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this means that God is tripersonal, which means while there's one God, one being who is God, there are three persons, right? Persons in the being that is God, which means that the Father can love the Son. 
As Jesus says, the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. And the Holy Spirit obviously loves the Son because Jesus says, He will glorify me. Right? The Holy Spirit loves our fellow believers because He's inspiring us to love each other as well. But this means that God from eternity past has always been love. Which means one of the most beautiful attributes of God, God being love, is consistent with Trinitarian Christian theology, whereas it's very difficult to substantiate with other views. But you might ask why three and not just two? Why can't it just be the father and son loving each other? And there are some philosophers who've like sort of put their minds to this to try to figure. So let me throw out some philosophy here. I'm not quoting scripture for this. Scripture proves the doctrine of the Trinity. It shows that God is love. This is a philosophical sidebar um, suggesting why three and not two. Perhaps one reason. And this could be that with two people, they might love each other. But when they have a third there's a new kind of love that can be expressed. See, because the Father can love the Son, the Son can love the Father, but if there were no Holy Spirit, then the two of them cannot work together to love a third. And that is a different kind of love. And you, you see this with parents. Parents, you know, when they are married and they're, they're just concerned with loving one another, and that's a beautiful thing, but there's something else that happens when they have a baby, and now they're able to love a third. And the two of them sacrifice their sleep, their, their, their date night or whatever they sacrifice in order to love the third. And that has a, a different kind of love quality to it, doesn't it? And with three, there's always the ability for two of the, of the members of the Trinity to love the third. And there's like a selflessness in God that can, can be exhibited because of the Trinity. I think this is beautiful. So the, the Holy Spirit loves. There's another uh, another thing. So I, I think that um, the last thing I'll mention on the, do, the idea that the Holy Spirit's a person before we go to the deity of the Holy Spirit, and that is an issue we do need to cover, but it's not so hard to cover once you see the scriptures. Um, I want to mention one thing that nobody else says, okay? Maybe this is me being weird. It, it's possible, okay? I've never heard someone make this argument, right? And I, and I haven't read every theology book, but I haven't heard the argument. So I want to say that whenever I give you something that is original to me, I want you to know it's original to me, not for a pat on the back, but so that you might go, I'll just consider that, Mike. You might be on your own there. Maybe you're being weird. So here's my conjecture. It goes like this. It's pretty simple. You might think it's pretty obvious too and agree with me. In the Bible, spirits are personal. This is, this is consistent. Like spirits are personal in the Bible. Where in the Bible are spirits non-personal, right? When, uh, when spirits are there in scripture, you know, the spirit of the deceased, uh, uh, an angelic spirit type thing, they're always personal. It's weird to think that God's going to use the term spirit to speak of the Holy Spirit, and now it's impersonal. It's an impersonal description. That seemed very strange to me. So I think just the weight of Scripture always using um, spirit to talk about a personal entity, something that's personal. It's weird that, say, JWs or others would, would be taught, sadly taught, because I love JWs. I just want them to not be JWs anymore <laughs> and just be Christians. Um, it's sad that they're taught that uh, the word spirit somehow means something like an active force. Uh, so let's talk now about the deity of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is Islam that teaches that the Holy Spirit is actually the angel Gabriel. That's actually the teaching there. Islam seems as though when it started, Muhammad was very confused about the doctrine of the Trinity. He seems to think, as you read the Quran, he seems to think the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and Mary. <laughs> might show you the kind of Christians he was interacting with that maybe weren't representing it well. Um, but he thinks that it's the Father, Son, and Mary, and, and Islam's rejecting that. But then you're like, well, then what do they do with the Holy Spirit? Well, they say the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. Um, and so let's talk about that. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, back to Ananias and Sapphira, Peter says to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds for yourself, part of the proceeds of the land? So he lies to the Holy Spirit. Now keep that in mind. Peter's big issue is you're not just, you're not just deceiving men. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. You're lying to the whole church. You're, you're, you're breaking the beautiful sincerity that there is in Christian brotherhood with your hypocrisy, your spiritual hypocrisy. And um, let's keep going. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Boom. I'm sorry. This, that's a boom, right? Because he goes, you lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you lied to God. You might be like, well, maybe Peter's talking about two different lies, two different things. One of them was a lie to the Holy Spirit. The other one was a lie to God. But he talks about it like it's a deed singular that he has done. Ananias, you did one thing. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to God because that's the same thing because the Holy Spirit is God. I think that's a pretty neat 
passage for that. We can, all, we can also go to Psalm 139. Now, for those who are my, my theology geeks, uh, or maybe you're becoming, am I making you a theology geek? I hope so. I hope so. I hope I'm making you get excited uh, as I am about this stuff. But Psalm 139 for the theology geeks out there or, or, or soon to be theology geeks is uh, a beautiful passage about the omniscience and omnipresence of God. And it's a passage that theologians often go to, Psalm 139, to demonstrate that God is omnipresent, that he transcends space, and that God knows all things. He's omniscient. So let's look at the passage briefly. Um, I could read a lot of it, but I'll read some of it. Oh, Lord, you've searched me and known me. So God, you, you know me fully, right? You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. That's interesting. God knows what you're thinking, uh, seems before you even think it. You search out my path and my lying down and all are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So he, he can predict the stuff that you're going to say. He knows the future. That's, that's a side issue that, uh, for another video. But yeah, God knows the future. You hem me in behind and before and you lay and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. So this first section is about the om, omniscience of God. God knows all things. Then he talks about God's omnipresence. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I go up, go down, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. Um, anyway, God is in, in all places. He knows all things and he's in all places. Omniscient, omnipresent. Now here's what we sometimes miss. Even theologians sometimes skip over this. This is a description of the spirit. Where shall I go from your spirit? The spirit is omnipresent. That's interesting, isn't it? Not just God is, I mean, obviously God is, but specifically the spirit is, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. That means that, of course, this glorious, high, lofty theology passage on the omnipresence of God is specifically applied to the Holy Spirit. Also, the Holy Spirit is personal in this Old Testament passage. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? You could say, oh, well, that's his impersonal force, except he then relates this to him it being God. If I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there because God's presence is God being present, right? This is God's spirit. So this is personhood and deity in this glorious, theologically weighty psalm. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, verses 10 and 11. This is again speaking of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It says, To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So these are just different gifts of the Spirit that are given. All these are empowered by the one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, earlier I said this uh, as a way of pointing out that um, that God has a will, right? That that the Holy Spirit has a will. But but notice this, that this is what the Holy Spirit's will is controlling is the gifts of God. That's pretty significant. He's not just, distrib see, if he was just a power and if he was impersonal or if he was just an angel, he'd be distributing the gifts of God according to instructions that come from God. But here the Holy Spirit gives the gifts out as he wills. His will controls the gifts of God. Why? Because he's God. That would be the reason why. Let me go to another extremely beautiful, theologically packed passage that I think most of us miss. Two verses in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. And look at the description of the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Now I'm going to suggest that this, this shows that the Holy Spirit is God, but it gives us more than that. It gives us some details about this that are, I think, exciting to hear. Uh, for who knows a person's thoughts? Here's an analogy to explain what Paul means. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? Now, what Paul is talking about is your, your self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is something no one else has. You have your self-knowledge. Nobody else has your self-knowledge. Um, and, and this kind of trips me out to think about it. We have like uh, over a thousand people watching right now that are, that are watching during the live stream. And each one of you is in a different place. You're in a different life situation. Even as I say these things, you have thoughts going on in your mind. And nobody knows this stuff but you. Even your closest loved ones don't know you as well as you know you. You know you the most, which is, of course, why you know you need Jesus. <laughs> but, but your self-knowledge is pretty impressive, right? But it's something that only you possess. 
Paul is saying the Holy Spirit possesses the self-knowledge of God, which is because the Holy Spirit is God. He knows the deep things of God because he is God. Why is that so important to you as a Christian? This is amazing. Because the Spirit is revealing things to you that are from the, the, the deep things of God. We receive in the Spirit. We receive intimate connection with God, knowledge from God, information from God. And yes, like the Scripture trumps anything you think the Spirit's leading you in because what we know God says always trumps what we think God's saying. That seems pretty pretty simplistic, my, uh, my whole theology there. But the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God because he is, he is, he is a demonstration there of God's self-knowledge. I think that's beautiful. So the Holy Spirit is God. Also, he shares a name with the Father and the Son, Matthew 28. I could also go to like 100 verses that say the Holy Spirit is God's spirit, which of course means he's not Gabriel. Um, and you could go to 100 of those verses, but um, just mentioning that. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus gives the commission to spread the gospel around the world and tells us to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the theology geeks, you already know this. It's a singular name, yet there are three persons mentioned, Father, Son, Spirit, but only one name. Well, who else has the same name as the Father? Well, only if you're God, do you have the same name as the Father? So the Son, he has the same name as the Father in, the, in, in this context. Obviously, name can be used in different ways. Um, his name is Jesus. The Father's name is not Jesus. I'm not saying that. But, uh, but the Holy Spirit here, if you're going to just take the verse in context, he must also be God. Because it would be weird for him to be an angel. Baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and, you know, the angel Gabriel, who has the same name as the Father and the Son. It just doesn't make any sense. It's obviously forced upon Scripture. Now, let me talk about some more Old Testament stuff. There are those who would think that um, we, we don't have as much information about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And I partly agree. Um, there are definitely, there's more clarity and more details about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament than the Old. That's true. But it's not new in the sense of novel. It never was the case before new. Rather, I, I think it's like this. The, this analogy I heard was great. Maybe it'll help you guys too. When you look at the Old Testament, it's as though you're looking at a room that is dimly lit. And you, you definitely see things. Some stuff you can make out pretty clearly. Okay, you can make out God's monotheism very clearly. Um, his calling of Israel, uh, the promises of a Messiah. Like there's certain things, but certain elements of the Messiah are pretty fuzzy. And so this is kind of like you're looking into this room that's poorly lit. And and you, you see some objects clearly, but a lot of objects, you know they're there, but you can't tell quite what they are. And then somebody comes in and flips the light on. And this is like the New Testament. The New Testament is like shining the light, turning the light on. So you can look at the old and see what was always there. And so the light goes on and you look in the room and you go, oh, I mean, I knew there was a Messiah, but I didn't realize he looked quite like that. He was always there. All the shadows and the nuances and the contours are consistent with what I saw in the dimly lit room, the Old Testament. But there's more detail and more clarity. So that's what we see. Um, and we can see this with the Holy Spirit, not just with Jesus. This, I get, I love this stuff because the consistency, the unity of the Bible, um, it's it, somehow it's just rewarding to even just know that God has been working this way in the text of scripture. It, there's just something, I don't know, life-giving about it. Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2, the creation story, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, this passage seems to be referring to the Holy Spirit. Now, some would suggest that this is just this is just uh, the Hebrew word ruach, and there's an interesting dynamic here uh, in Hebrew and in Greek. The word for spirit, wind, and um, breath are all the same word. So, in Hebrew, it's ruach, and ruach can be can be used to speak of my breath, or it can be used to speak of the wind, or it can be used to speak of that spiritual sort of like um, immaterial aspect of of of, of persons. So that's, that's ruach. And in Greek, it's pneuma. And it can be used in all those same ways. And so here, some rarely, but some translators will try to say, and the breath of God or the wind of God was hovering over the face of the waters. But it seems to me that when you look at the rest of scripture, you can confirm this is definitely rightly translated spirit. And it's speaking here. Here's my application for us. It's speaking of the role of the Holy Spirit in creation. And when we look at some other passages in scripture, that also comment on the creation of the world and the creation of mankind, we're going to see that there's, there's um, 
a lesson here for us. Okay, let's let's look at Psalm 33, 6. This is, this is one of those creation passages. You know, the Bible talks about creation in more than just Genesis. It's in Psalms, it's in Job, it's in various places. Here it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Now is where I want to like turn the New Testament light on. And I want to shine that light to get even more clarity on this very passage. Because we know that in John 1, 1, the word of the Lord through whom the heavens were made is Jesus, right? John 1 tells us in the beginning was the word, the word was without form and void. Um, and then the word, the word, I just mixed Genesis 1 and John 1. I don't know what that was. <laughs> in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it says that all things were made through him. All things were made through him. So everything was made through the word. John would say, I'm, fl I'm flicking the light on. This is Jesus. The Trinity is active in creation. And here the breath of the Lord of his mouth creates the hosts. That's super interesting because what we're getting here is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in Psalm 33, 6, active in creation. So that's not Gabriel, guys. That's not Gabriel. In Genesis 2, 7, we can do this again when I compare Genesis 2 to Job 33. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground, of dust from the ground, and breathed into his, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Now that you, you could say, well, that's breath. Okay, but it that would be a little strange to think it's only talking about breath. It's probably using breath to speak of the Holy Spirit here. And I can support this with Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now this is a Hebrew parallelism. The Spirit of God has made me is going to say something is, is basically being repeated. This phrase is repeated. The idea is repeated again differently. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. So in Job 33, 4, you know, scripture commenting on scripture, what we have is um, a, uh, an example of the fact that when God breathes on Adam, he's giving him life by the Holy Spirit. This doesn't mean Adam is indwelt by the Spirit. I'm not saying he... Uh, he's indwelt by the spirit here. That's not the idea. Rather, that the spirit, the Holy Spirit is the source of life for humankind. That people, all people need the Holy Spirit to be alive, not indwelling them, but sustaining them. This is the spirit's work in keeping us going, so to speak, bringing us to life and keeping us alive. You need God every moment of every day to be alive. Every second, you need him to be alive for the universe to even continue to exist. So we have Father, Son, and Spirit all active in those things. Now, some would say, but Mike, this is Job. And you, you, you know, good students of the Bible know that Job has some pretty sketchy content, right? Job and his friends, they have many, many chapters of stuff they say. And at the end of the book, God rebukes them all. They all get rebuked and they all have to repent. That's interesting. So how seriously am I supposed to take this? Well, in Job 33, we actually have Elihu speaking. And Elihu was the only friend of Job that didn't get rebuked. So as you read Job, you got to take some things with a bit of a grain of salt. There's a mixture of things in there. Sometimes what you're really getting is the emoting of mankind, the feelings of mankind, the thoughts of mankind. They're not always accurate. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. You use other scriptures to try to determine that. But Elihu is never rebuked. So I think that he has proper commentary on the creation of mankind here. And let's see... Um, 2 Samuel 23, let's go to another text. Uh, the Holy Spirit's active. I, I mentioned this before, that the Holy Spirit's active in giving scripture. But here's an example from the Old Testament that says as much. Right? Hebrews says that Psalms are the Holy Spirit speaking. But look at this. Here's the last words of David in Psalm, 2 Samuel 23. The oracle of David, meaning it's like prophetic. The son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high. The anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. And then he goes on and gives his, his final like poem. This is significant because not only is he confirming, even from Old Testament perspective, that the Holy Spirit is inspiring the things that are being written here. But the spirit of the Lord is also the God of Israel. Yeah, because there's that parallelism again. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. So this is uh, another thing for the, the deity of the Holy Spirit and his um, inspiration of scripture. 
Now, some would accuse, again, some would accuse the New Testament of making this stuff up. I see this all the time. Skeptics will do this. And no offense, skeptics. Like, I'm not mad at you or nothing. But when you're skeptical of the Bible and you're trying to say Christianity is wrong, I think your data is wrong. And I, I like to show you that. And that I consider a kindness because I'm trying to point you to the truth of Christ because I want you to have the hope that I have. And this is one of those areas where sometimes skeptics... They, um, they become overly cynical about scripture. And so the, the, the tendency I see on internet skeptics is they'll very quickly believe something negative about the Bible without much sort of confirmation or research. And then they'll spread those things. And, and then gullible people tend to pull, pick them up and spread them as well. One of the things they'll spread occasionally is the idea that, of course, this uh, theology of the Bible, our bibliology, our view that the Bible is inspired of God is is a new thing. Well, I just shared you with you one scripture that says that David knowingly thought he was speaking by the Holy Spirit. So that's not a new thing at all. But also in Zechariah 7.12, wait, am I already there? I'm already there. Um, oh, now I'm not there. Hold on. All right, I'll, oh, you're not there. Okay. <laughs> Zechariah 7.12 in this verse, it says, they made their hearts diamond hard lest they should hear the law. And the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by the Spirit through the former prophets. This is interesting because this implies that now the law, the Pentateuch, is all clearly, clearly from God. Like the theology of the Old Testament, the Old Testament is convinced of this. But here, Zechariah, an Old Testament prophet, says that basically all the prophets they've got, all the former prophets, these would be the, the, the big ones, Ezekiel, those guys, that they were speaking by the word of this of, of the Lord through the Spirit, so that's and, and you could just you could go through scripture after scripture. How many times they say the word of the Lord came to me, um, the Spirit of God spoke to me, and then they and then they speak. This happens all the time. Okay, now I'm gonna do something real fun, which is we're gonna look at um, sort of I, I don't know what to call this. You could say it's like typology of the Holy Spirit, but it might be a little different than that. It's more like um, the progressive theology of the Holy Spirit in in longing and fulfillment. Does anybody understand what I just said? I don't know. But Jesus, uh, to give an illustration of what I'm about to do, Jesus gives us, um, or I should say the Old Testament gives us the longing for Jesus. Like there's this such longing for him and there's types and pictures of him and there's prophecies of him and there's all this stuff. And the New Testament pro provides the fulfillment of all of those things. And it's the, my favorite study in the world is to study the connection between the Old and New Testaments through the lens of who Christ is. But the, the Holy Spirit is also like this in the Bible. I'll give you some examples. Um, Isaiah 63, 11. These are just some examples. I could do this all day. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where he, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea, who shepherds with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in them, in the midst of them, his Holy Spirit? Sorry for my stuttering there on that verse. Uh, but God put his spirit in the midst of them. This is speaking of the time when Moses led the people of Israel. So it's the tabernacle and the Holy Spirit's in their midst. Now, those who know their Bibles know this. The Holy Spirit wasn't in them in the New Testament sense. The Holy Spirit was with them or in the midst of them in the tabernacle. But even then, in the tabernacle, there's this separation. And here's the picture I want you to, to, to think of. God's Old Testament picture of the Holy Spirit being with people is it's, it's like partially with them. He's kind of with them. He's with them in the sense that he's there in the tabernacle. He might even lead and guide them through the cloud or the pillar of fire, but he's not accessible, right? In that tabernacle, nobody can go in there. The high priest goes once a year and he better come right or else he's in trouble, right? Remember Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, these two original high priests, they were going to inherit the high priest job after Aaron. And they go into the temple uh, in, the, in the tabernacle and they do it wrong. And they have the wrong attitude. They're not observing, you know, they're not honoring God right. And they're stricken dead on the spot. So God's with his people. But this is like a partial with his people. And this is, this is a consistent message of the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is like there, but not, not in the ideal way. There's something missing. This is the longing for the Holy Spirit. We get this in Numbers chapter 1129 where Moses speaks of his longing that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. The idea is that, man, I just wish, I wish that this thing, the Holy Spirit would come on Moses, came on some of the elders of Israel, but he came on Saul, but these are individuals. This isn't the whole nation. And there's just this longing like, oh, 
Moses ex- echoes it. Oh, I wish, I wish that God could just put his spirit on everybody. But instead, there's this separation, there's these layers, there's all these differences. Even those who have the spirit are under threat of losing it, like, like uh, David did at the time with Psalm 51. And, and this is beautiful because when you look at this in the lens of Old and New Testament, you realize the Holy Spirit's not accessible through Moses. Moses longs for it, but can't achieve it. Moses represents the law. Through the law, you, you can see God's spirit. You, you have like, you get close, but not there. You find out when you get close that you're a sinner who, who needs forgiveness and that you're kind of hopeless and you'll never make it. Jesus comes. He becomes a sacrifice for you. He fulfills the law. And then when he dies, the veil is ripped in the temple from top to bottom. The, the idea is saying the access to the Holy Spirit is now granted. And then Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and fills the church. But it's not just present in the Old Testament through longing. It's present in the Old Testament through specific prophecy. Let's look at Ezekiel 36. This is this is awesome. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is a statement to Israel that there's a future time coming where I'm not just going to give you the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. I'm going to put my spirit in you personally, all of you. You will all receive the spirit. And that will become your motive for transformation. This will become the thing that internally changes you because you're never going to be good enough until it's me changing and transforming you from the inside out. This is New Testament theology, but it's right here in the Old Testament. Why? Because it's the same It's the same theology through it all. Now, what's also cool is in Ezekiel 36, this is the Valley of Dry Bones passage. Some of you would know. Ezekiel comes and he sees a valley of dry bones. He has some kind of vision, right? And it's a valley full of de- dead men's bones. And then God tells him, prophesy to the bones. And he prophesies and the bones come together. So he speaks and the bones come together. Then he says, you know, breathe on them. And and then he breathes on them and the, and the bones come to life. And then God interprets the vision. I'm going to put my spirit in you. Now, here's what I think is also really neat. Uh, Ezekiel, and forgive me for not taking all day to explain each of these points. I'm just kind of racing through to give you a lot of details. But Ezekiel is, I think, a great type of Christ. Ezekiel is a prophet who is also, he's a priest, who's also uh, um, uh, um, coming out to, to do all the prophecy. So the, let me see, how do I explain this quickly? The priests in Israel had a very special role that they were to bear the sin of the people. In that, they pictured Christ. The prophets in Israel have a different role. Ezekiel is a marriage of those roles. And Ezekiel pictures Christ in a very special way. He's the one prophet who is said to be bearing the sin of the people. And when Ezekiel does weird things in the book of Ezekiel, like he has to lie down naked, right? Because he's showing the shame of Israel. And God shows Israel their shame by shaming Ezekiel. Or he has to eat unclean food to show that Israel will be eating unclean food because they're going to be delivered to their enemies. And so he has to eat unclean food. Ezekiel keeps going through the shame that Israel deserves. And he's the guy in the Bible who more than, other than Jesus, he's the one who's called son of man more than anyone else. Because he pictures Christ who comes in his high priestly role to bear our sin, bear our shame. And then at the end of all that, he's the one who will speak to the bones and they'll come together. And then he breathes and gives them the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel stands here to represent Christ. Jesus shows up. He gives us the gospel. He creates the gospel through his death and resurrection. And then when we hear the word of Christ, And we believe it through Jesus. We have access to the Holy Spirit. We're given new life. This is the theology of the New Testament lived out in the Old Testament in great detail. I think it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. And finally, uh, we have Revelation 21, where if you want to take, I'm just going to skip right to the end here. The final goal, the final longing of God to be with his people is fulfilled Right, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. This speaks of, of, of the, the new heaven and new earth. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Our intim- This is, you know, in all the secular movies and TV shows, when they talk about heaven, they always blow it. It's just inevitably they blow it. First, they, they tend to have these weird, shallow views of heaven. But what's missing from heaven And what's missing from what we're really looking for is not just my temporary location in heaven, but of the new heaven and new earth that are created. But what they miss from those things is God's presence. 
the intimate, personal, pervasive presence of God, the, the joy that we will constantly feel being that close to God who is love, who is holy, and being united to him with no barriers and no boundaries, that is the longing of the Bible and that is accomplished in the Holy Spirit. I think we have neglected the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We have neglected. Now there's more, there's more in the, in the Old Testament. Let me give you one. Isaiah 63, verse 13 and 14 um, wait, no, I, did I? I think I already covered that one. I think I covered that one already. I might be rethinking this because I taught the same thing yesterday and sometimes I, my brain gets a little confuzzled on it. But Nehemiah 9.20, let's go to this passage. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. This is the role of the Holy Spirit in the wanderings of Israel. And it said he gave the spirit to instruct them. This would not have come individually. This would have come through Moses. Moses was the one speaking with God, getting the words from God and sharing with the people. Okay, so this is instruction, but again, instruction at a distance because it's old covenant, not new covenant. He didn't withhold their manna from their mouth. That, that obviously, that's typology of Jesus, right? The manna, Jesus comes, he says, I'm the bread of life and gave them water for their thirst now, Jesus taps into this typology to talk about our New Testament experience, and that's in John 7. Keep in mind this. God gave them his spirit to instruct, manna from heaven, and water for their thirst. Now, let's look at what Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up. Now, this is a feast that commemorates the giving of water to the people of Israel which is, seems to be connected to the spirit somehow. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus being our access to the spirit. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he, this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. Just as in the Old Testament, God guided them by his spirit from a distance, though when you come to Jesus in the new, he will individually give you the Holy Spirit. You will be filled. You will know God. You will be with God. God will be with you. Beautiful. Okay, let me give you another one, another parallel between Old and New Testament. This is Exodus 31. I remember first reading this when I was a kid, just reading my Bible for the first time through when I was a teenager and being really excited when I found this out. This is where God inspires by his spirit craftsmen who build the temple they're doing practical like artwork and, and building skills but he, they're given gifts by the spirit to do it really unique but it totally relates to new testament theology is exodus 31 1 the lord said to moses see i've called by name bezalel the son of uri son of Hur of the tribe of judah and i filled him with the spirit of god with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. Then he talks about others he's anointed and appointed to do buildings. Now, these aren't just normal buildings. It's not just random. The Bible's like, hey, someone's always going to build stuff, and God helped him. This is to build the tabernacle. This is to build God's, the place of God's, the dwelling of God's spirit. Keep that in mind because this is where it connects to the New Testament. In the New Testament, we're taught clearly that the gifts of the Spirit are to help us that we might build the body of Christ, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is a picture how the anointing of the Spirit came on a few people to build the tabernacle so the Spirit comes upon all of us that we might all build the body of Christ. You have gifts given to you by the Spirit that you might be a blessing to other people in the body. That's the intention, that we might grow up into him who is the head. This, again, this is what I mean about typology. Old and New Testament is not just about Jesus. It also speaks of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is related to the Holy Spirit deeply throughout his whole ministry. Um, the Holy Spirit's the one who prophesied Jesus. The Holy Spirit miraculously made Mary pregnant. She was, the Holy Spirit came upon her and uh, miraculously made her pregnant. The Holy Spirit initiates Jesus's public ministry when the Holy Spirit descends upon Christ like a dove. Then the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Then he comes out of the wilderness empowered by the Holy Spirit, scripture says. The Holy Spirit's how Jesus cast out demons, although I think he also used it, his own power. I don't think it was one or the other. I think it's like the creation account. It's Father, Son, and Spirit all active in different ways. And the Holy Spirit raised Jesus. Here's an interesting verse. Romans 1, 4. The Holy Spirit's active in the resurrection of Christ. 
And Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. This seems to speak of the Holy Spirit being active in the resurrection of Jesus. There's a couple other verses that speak of this as well in the scriptures. Um, But what I would want to highlight for you is that here we have a beautiful parallel. So we found in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit's active in creation, just like the Father and Son are. We also see in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is active in um, redemption, just like the Father and Son are, right? The Father sends his Son, the Son dies on the cross for our sin, uh, and we hear the preaching of, of the gospel, and the Holy Spirit regenerates us. So we see all three active in our salvation. We also see all three active in the resurrection. So the, there's verses that speak of the Father raising the, the Son, there's verses that speak of the Son raising himself, and there's verses that speak of the Holy Spirit raising him. Now, if you're one of those who thinks, well, which one is it? Then you're not understanding the doctrine of the Holy Spirit because the three are one. Three are one. The three persons are one God. So you can easily overlap in those in those descriptions. All right, finally, um, two last things to share with you guys, then we're all done. One is this. We should not overlook no doctrine of the Holy Spirit, no study of the Holy Spirit is, is, is sufficient if we overlook the selflessness of the Spirit. Now, when we look at the Son, we see the submission of the Son. That would be the, the primary like thing we see in the relationship of the Son and the Father, the submission of the Son. He, ch- he chooses to submit to the Father, submit to his guidance, submit to his direction, only doing the things the Father tells him to do, uh, obeying the Father even to the cross. So we see obedience and submission. In the Holy Spirit, obedience and submission are not the right terms. Selflessness seems to be the right term because Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will come and he will speak of me. He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit is drawing attention to Jesus, not to himself. Now, some have complained. Let me bring a practical view on this. Some have complained like, why, you know, God being for his own glory, that's kind of selfish, isn't it? Being for your own glory. And, you know, when I was younger, I would push back on this. And I think this is proper pushback. And I'd say, well, it's not when he really does have that glory. I mean, that's not inappropriate. I mean, for instance, a parent telling a child like, no, you will respect me. That doesn't have to be, you could be selfish and arrogant, or you could just be like, no, no, it's proper that you respect me. I am your parent. You should respect me. That's right. You don't have to be arrogant or selfish to do that. So God could be for his own glory simply because he really is glorious. But there's another sense in which, because God's tripersonal, Jesus can selflessly be for the glory of Christ, right? The the son can selflessly be for the glory of the father. There's, There's a sense of selflessness in God's own glory seeking that doesn't exist with you. It's one thing if the wife says to the husband, wow, you've done such a good job. I'm so proud of you. It's something else if the husband turns to his wife and says, I've done such a good job. I'm so proud of me. <laughs> like there's, it's just different. Again, the doctrine of the Trinity seems to make more sense of this, in my opinion. But the selflessness of the spirit is one of the highlighted things we have in the scripture. And I think it may be because of this, my theory on this. And I know I'm not alone in this, but I just want to say I don't, I don't have clear teaching of scripture making this connection. I'm making this connection. And the connection is to say, the spirit is selfless speaking of the son because he's the one who fills the church and the church is to be selflessly speaking of the son. You and me, our lives don't matter as much as the name and glory of Christ. The purpose of my life being to glorify his name and make his name known in the world, that's worth it because I want to glorify him just as the Holy Spirit. I mean, you ever wonder why as a Christian, when you got saved, you just want to bring glory to the name of Jesus. Like you just, you want to, it's not just something you're religiously supposed to do. Like you just want to bring glory to God. This is the work of the spirit in your life because he's, he is selfless and and he's producing that selflessness in you. He is love and he's producing that love in your life. So I I think it's, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. All right. And the final thing I'll mention that the second and final thing for today is some application. Um, So we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, as I've mentioned a half dozen times now. But in 1 Corinthians, we get a new perspective on that. I mentioned that the um, work of the Spirit in our life and the, and the knowledge of God, who God is, that is supposed to be our motive, that highest rung of obedience to God, which is love and appreciation and joy, that these, these motives driving us towards holiness and kindness towards others, forgiving all that, that, that that's where we want to be. This is, this is where I think the Holy Spirit's driving us and pulling us and drawing us. 
I think that this is consistent with the New Testament as well. So not only is the Holy Spirit my deep relational connection with God, right? God, the Father and Son make their home in me through the Holy Spirit. Not only that, not only by the Spirit do I cry out, Abba, Father, and I have this deep personal connection and relationship with God. Not only by the Spirit do I, can I pray from the deepest place of my heart to God and he knows all that I'm going through. And not only is the Holy Spirit working in me to love others, but also to be holy. The Holy Spirit, he's holy and he's in me. And he is, both of us, he is driving us towards holiness. He wants you to be holy. And this is something that Paul taps into. Look at what he says to Corinth. Now, 1 Corinthians is the letter of the church that is written to a church with two major issues. If you read the whole book of 1 Corinthians, you see everything he says relates to one of two issues, unity and holiness. Or on the the flip side of it to say disunity in the body, people mistreating each other, and unholy behavior or sin in the body of Christ. Everything he says is relating to those two things. And at one point in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul seems almost exasperated with how they don't get it. And so he finally asks them, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I encourage you to meditate on this, like today, tomorrow, for as long as it takes, just meditate on the fact that you, if you're in Christ, you are the temple of the spirit. And Paul, the apostle thought to see a church with such disunity, with such sin in their lives, are they not getting what it means to be filled with the spirit in the first place? And so he he hits them up. He's like, don't you, don't you guys know? I mean, they knew it theologically, but did they get it? Did they really get it? And this is the encouragement for the rest of us. Your motive to love and serve God on the highest rung of morality is the love of God manifested in you through the Holy Spirit and his work in you. And as you think about committing a sin, as you think about compromising, as you think about holding on to bitterness, you need to think about the unity and love of the Holy Spirit that has been bestowed upon you by whom you are children of God. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that we would be more aware of the Holy Spirit. It seems like in Corinth, their issues of disunity and and sin were connected to their lack of genuine awareness of the Spirit, of the calling of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit. I mean, they were hugely into spiritual gifts, but the gifts aren't the giver, and they weren't thinking about the giver. We pray that we would think about you. We would be mindful of the fact that we're the temple of the Spirit, and it would be transformative for our lives sins that we found a hard time struggling with would suddenly everything would shift and change because now it's like lord this is about love this isn't just about not doing what i want to do it's about who i who i am and who i know and who i'm filled with and we pray lord that we would know we're bought with a price we would know we're the temple of the spirit and we would glorify you with all that we are in jesus name amen amen thank you all very much for joining um let's see next uh next week well this yeah, this Wednesday, you'll, you'll get a video from me. This Friday, it'll be the Q&A. Next Monday, I'm going to do an, another study in the Mark series. For the next two weeks, we'll be in the Mark series on Mondays. Then we're going to take a little break uh, for a few weeks just to have a little time off. And uh, I'll still be doing the Friday stuff, but um, but not the Monday videos. The Monday videos will be having a break for a couple weeks at least. Unless I pull interviews together. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I just make it up as I go along. So thank you all. Lord bless you. I appreciate you. The, the honor and privilege of being able to speak into your lives about the truth of God and minister to you in any way. It's a blessing to you. Give all the credit and glory to God. And um, that's about it. Take care.